Jay um, is a neurosurgical resident that is spending six months with us here in San Diego. Um, he's coming from uh, University of South Florida. We're honored to have him and uh, looking forward to his contributions um, uh, to this uh, to this fellowship. And anyways, welcome, Bud. And uh, why don't you go ahead and get going? Perfect. Thanks so much, Dr. Mundus. Um... Yeah, so the premise for today's talk, I was asked to discuss a point that either I had some research in or just had some interest in. And by that token, today we'll be talking about sacral pelvic fixation. Before we get into what it is, let's talk about why to do it. This is a table from a paper by Dr. Tumialan at Barrow and Dr. Mumineni up at UCSF where they go over the indications. But the big picture here is that if you're going to take and build a large construct in the lumbar or even thoracolumbar spine, and then mount it on the lumbosacral joint, well, you're going to put a lot of stress and strain on that joint, and it might make sense to back it up with some additional support. So what constitutes a big construct? Well, a decent rule of thumb is if your construct extends all the way up to L2 or even higher. And what you're actually doing then with this sacral pelvic instrumentation is a few things. One, you are protecting your S1 screw, which on biomechanical testing has been shown to be weak in flexion particularly. You're trying to prevent sacral insufficiency fractures, which can be associated with their own host of neurologic complications, including even a scarily cotoquina syndrome. And it's particularly relevant to consider using this type of instrumentation in patients who have a high pelvic incidence or a high sacral slope. Because uh, as you can imagine, these are the patients who are more prone to progressing and developing in spondylolisthesis at that L5 S1 joint. This is a image from a classic paper by O'Brien et al. where they define the three zones of the pelvis. Uh, zone one for proximal sacrum and S1. Zone two was defined as the alar wings to the distal sacrum. And then zone three was the ilium itself. And uh, this is relevant because early attempts at sacral pelvic instrumentation primarily, well, first of all, they had a high failure rate, unfortunately. And we later figured out that this was because those early techniques were largely instrumenting zones one and two. And now we know that for a successful construct, we really need to instrument zone three. And this picture on the right is from the latest edition of DeWalls, um, just showing the morphology of the bone, especially where the cortical layers are located, as well as the dimensions. This is a now classic paper by McCord et al., where they perhaps most importantly defined the pivot point of this joint at the back of the L5 S1 disc space in the midline. And the key point that we took away from this is that if you're going to instrument down to the pelvis, your instrumentation needs to at some point be anterior to this pivot point to make sense, to provide that very rigid stabilization. And you can see here on this image from the latest edition of Benzel's spine, this is just to really drive home that point from another angle, another perspective, that that's where that pivot point is and those are the forces acting on it. So you can see how instrumenting anterior to that point would be essential if you're going to mount a large construct here. This is from that same paper by McCord. It's a little tough to read the, the names on these charts, but um, basically at the time they had already developed a number of different techniques. And this study showed that the iliac screw, or at least its predecessor, the Galveston's rod, um, was the most resistant to strain and failure. And that kind of set the groundwork and the foundation for a lot of the innovation that has followed in this field ever since. I had to bring up this old slide from uh, Dr. Eastlack's lecture back in November, just because it so nicely laid out the evolution of instrumentation in this, in this field. Um, going from the classic Galveston rod all the way through iliac screws and S2AI screws and even SI joint fixation, which we'll talk about in a little bit as well. So that lineage of 
development basically led us to the modern day where we have two work uh, two um, workhorse techniques. One is the iliac screw or iliac bolt, and the other is the S2AI screw. So this iliac screw um, is a refinement of the original Galveston technique. This is from their paper in 1982 where they took actually not a screw, but the rod itself, um, angled it and drove it intraosseously into zone three. Um, and this was met with great success. Uh, interestingly enough, at the time, they actually um, secured this to the spine with wiring technique. And, and now we, of course, have medical screws, but that's where this idea comes from. And these are images from a couple modern textbooks just showing the angles, insertion point, and trajectory of this now very widespread technique. It was a good screw. You know, it's a, a lot of it is in bone, it's very rigid. And um, it can be very reliable from that standpoint. However, it does have a couple uh, drawbacks. One is that the insertion point and therefore the screw head is kind of pr proud. You know, it sits right there near the PSIS. And patients, when they sit down, especially if they don't have, don't have a lot of soft tissue covering over their sacrum and coccyx, they can feel this when they sit down. It can be very uncomfortable. And worse still, it can erode through the skin, cause infections, and a whole variety of nasty complications. We don't like that. Um, that's one. And then the second is that because you're inserting there near the back of that crest, your insertion point and your screw head is a bit lateral compared to the rest of your more cephalad instrumentation. And so it does require an offset connector to hook this up to the rest of your screws. Um, so there have been a couple things done to try to uh, compensate for those drawbacks. One is countersinking the top of the screw head, uh, basically just drilling away a bit of that posterior superior iliac spine, sinking the, the screw below the bone so the patients can't feel it as much. And uh, this image on the right also from DeWall just shows that even when you do that, because this is such a forgiving um, place, as long as the screw is placed properly, you still have a lot of rigid fixation, a lot of purchase. You can get an 80 or even 100 millimeter screw in this area, even with the countersinking. But, um, you know, innovation never sleeps. And these drawbacks led to the development of another, the other workhorse screw of the modern era, which is the S2AI screw, the Sacro Ailer Iliac screw. And this has some advantages. Um, the best of my knowledge, it was first described by Dr. Swanseller up at Hopkins in a in this talk from 2007 and then formally published in this paper from 2009. And it was attractive to him because he, of course, were, operates on a lot of pediatric patients who have less soft tissue covering. Um, and this was a lower profile screw. It's below the crest. And um, it is, so that's one, but it also is a more medial starting point. And so it's more easy to align this with the rest of the cephalide instrumentation, and you don't really require that offset connector that was required with the iliac screw or the iliac bolt. And then another cool point is that this screw crosses the SI joint, and that's relevant because it buys you at least tricortical fixation. You know, you enter the sacrum, you exit the sacrum, and you enter the ilium. So you're getting at least three areas of cortical fixation along the length of your screw uh, to make it more rigid, theoretically, which is a very nice advantage. Um, and so now that we have these two workhorse screws, as one might imagine, there's been a, quite a bit of effort focused on trying to determine is one better than the other? And the basic answer is that they're both pretty good. Um, this is... I'm going to show two studies. This is one nice biomechanical study from Burns et al. and spine deformity from just a few years ago. Where they basically found that the stiffness, inflection, extension, left and right movement uh, with both the iliac screw and the SDAI screw were pretty comparable, as well as their failure rates. So that was reassuring. This was a cadaveric biomechanical study. Here was another one, um, also recently from 2017, and they found similar results. There was no significant difference um, between the stiffness in all four dimensions of these two screws. So that's reassuring to know that we have you know, two pretty reliable techniques for instrumenting the pelvis. One question, however, is that, so it'll be easier if we go look at this slide again, 
again, we're crossing the SI joint here. And if you look closely at this figure from DeWald, the screws in the diagram and the CT are slightly different. The one in the diagram uh, um, is what we call partially threaded. You can see threads start about 40% of the way down the screw, starting from the screw head, and uh, then it's naked before that. Whereas in the CT, it might be a little bit hard to tell, but there are threads all the way up and down the shaft of that screw. So that could be called a fully threaded screw. And you know we love to compare things, and that could be another question of, is there any meaningful difference between these two types of screws? Should we, should we be using one versus the other? And the, the group at University of South Florida under Dr. Alakani looked to try to answer this with some preliminary data. This is just demonstrates the idea between the partially threaded and the fully threaded screw. And the thought here was that maybe because you've got threads all the way down, it might better stabilize before and after the SI joint. Um, and that could help prevent a known subsequent um, uh, phenomenon after long construct fusion, which is SI joint arthropathy. You know, the idea here is that if you've got a long construct mounted on the lumbosacral joint, well, then the SI joint might be thought of as the next adjacent joint, and adjacent segment disease in this context might actually occur at the SI joint, and it's a known thing that some of these patients go on to develop SI joint pain. And so that was the endpoint for this, um, this early study. And they did find, interestingly, that the fully threaded screws did have an improved time to development of SI joint pain and lower incidence at uh, approximately 24 months. However, importantly, they did not see different rates of fusion uh, between the partially threaded and fully threaded implants. So that's an interesting point. And then that leads to another question with the sacral pelvic instrumentation that is still kind of being researched and is an area of interest um, that, okay, if we're saying that patients might develop SI joint pain after these surgeries, does it, does it make sense to go ahead and just fuse that SI joint ahead of time? And that's kind of a controversial area. Um, the same group looked to try to try to clarify that question. And they, this is not a prospective trial, but it is a prospective database that was then retrospectively reviewed. And they looked at patients who had had, in this case, S2AI screws with uh, simultaneous SI joint fusion and without. Um, and they did find that, at least in their limited series, the rate of SI joint pain after surgery was nearly 50% in those who were not fused ahead of time versus those who were. So that's interesting. It's preliminary data. It's this was only three month follow up, but if that's true, it is interesting. Of course, you know more metal is not a trifling matter, and if this is something that catches speed in the years to come, I know there's the bedrock trial and a couple other studies trying to look at this. If it is something that catches speed, it'll definitely need to be something that, like everything, is discussed at at length with the patient just so they know what they're getting themselves into. As we've said, innovation never sleeps. Um, perhaps the latest uh, thing that's catching fire in this area is this kickstand rod that came out of Dr. Lenke's group up at Columbia. This is the original paper from 2018. The idea here was that, okay, we know that sacral pelvic instrumentation might help stabilize these large constructs. But if you have a patient with very significant coronal imbalance that is predominantly caudal at the bottom of the spine, um, would that patient and that spine benefit from some more support and achieve a more durable outcome? And so that was the idea here. So this is a rod that is mounted on the top of the iliac crest and then connected up to the construct more cephalad around the thoracolumbar junction. When you do this, it allows the surgeon to then distract across this rod and achieve a more achieve perhaps a more stable correction, but also perhaps a more durable correction with less rates of recurrence because there's a rod there holding the spine up in the coronal plane. Interesting technique. Um, it's still very new. A cursory you know review of PubMed shows that there's only 14 papers. Um, currently published on this technique that at least involve those terms, including this one by our own Dr. Mundus, Dr. Eastlack, and the rest of the International Spine Study Group. 
in their paper from earlier this year, they really nicely illustrated the concept here with that uh, distraction across that rod and correction of that coronal imbalance. It is early days for the kickstand rod, but there is some nice data. Um, on the left was a recent literature review from a couple years ago that included three studies, uh, one by Dr. Lenke's group, um, that's the Mockney et al. paper, reference six. Um, and they had 45 patients total in this small meta-analysis and found only four complications, so relatively low complication rate, though of course it's early days and further studies are certainly needed. And then from the paper by the ISSG, they did find at one year follow-up nicely that there was improved alignment that was durable at one year, but at least at that point, there was no significant difference between clinical outcomes in the form of patient recorded health outcomes. However, it's only one year follow up and one might hypothesize or imagine that as that population is followed in the long term, this new kickstand rod might give them a more durable solution and they might have more durable benefits to their patient recorded clinical outcomes uh, at two, four, five, and even 10 year follow up. So it'll be very interesting to follow those patients and see what comes of them as time passes. So that's what I've got for you. You know, there are some interesting things coming down the pipeline. A lot of them are already here. Uh, questions that are still remain in this area are, you know, the role of minimally invasive techniques that are now being developed and are kind of gaining popularity around the country as surgeons as a group uh, overcome that learning curve. Again, this question of whether or not to fuse the sacred iliac joint will be one to keep an eye on. And then seeing what the long-term follow-up uh, and the proof of the pudding, proof in the pudding of these kickstand rods turns out to be. And that's what I've got for you today. I'd really be interested in any perspective from surgeons in the group who you know, have experience with this and can comment from their own experience about this type of instrumentation, any pearls or nuggets. And uh, thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks, Chad. Chad. I, I'll uh, put a little plug for the anti S2 AI. So the traditional iliac bolt that you showed is definitely more lateral. Um, there's a way to place that bolt now where you're not coming on top of the ilium, but rather working from inside um, the crest so that you have your starting point literally at the level of the sacrum. And as a result, you're no longer so lateral. And if anything, you're almost perfectly lined up. Um, I would argue that the S2 AI screws are very medial in their start. Um, and the because of their very lateral trajectory, the tulip head usually ends up um, being fit, being in, in a medial facing direction versus your um, sacral screw, your S1 screw, is usually in a lateral facing orientation. So that makes the hookup a lot more, a, a little bit more challenging um, when you're when you're when you're hooking those up. So just to give you the perspective that it's uh, it's the same problem, just the opposite direction. Um, and usually you don't use medial offset connectors. I think for the most part, people are just bending the rod into the tulip head. But you'll see a lot of people that use S2 AI have the the bottom looks like a little bit like a hook as they're trying to get that rod into the into the s2 ai screw so um just uh you know i don't i don't think it's a that that part i like i don't love as much the other thing about the s2 ai screw it's usually starting a little bit more distal so um it's a little usually a little bit of a flatter trajectory rather than uh from superior to inferior so those are two I think things that people don't talk about as much. The data is pretty good, though, regarding whether or not those screws are are good, and it seems to be that the S2 AI screws are performing pretty pretty well. So, um, anyways, I would just thought I'd throw that comment out there and let someone rip that apart if they want. Um, I'm not going to rip this part of the comments. Um, I I think that 
what Greg said is even more true with MIS because you tend to have a more lateral starting point for S1 screws. So it feels even more painful to get connected with your S2 ALR iliac bolts, but open technique, usually you're starting your S1 screws more medial. It, it, there's less of a medialization of the throw, and you can deviate your starting point a little bit depending on anatomy for the S2 AIs, but um, the, the low iliac bolts are definitely the most favorable for an NY hookup. Um, that they don't necessarily answer the question that remains outstanding, which is, um, you know, is, is stabilization and arthrodesis of the SI joint a proper thing to do ahead of time, or should we wait for it to become a clinical syndrome or problem before we, we fix it? Um, and the jury's still out on that. Right. Science and time will tell. So can I comment a little bit on what um, Greg said and ask Greg and Bob some questions about their bedrock technique and your experience? But I agree with you, Greg, that the um, S2AI screws end up medially. I get I have the same problem. But the other problem I have is that this so rigid fixation. If you put in S2AI screws, I thought my rods pop off the, the S2AI screws. I wonder if anyone's had that experience. And the way I've gotten around taking care of that is to put in a cross link at the very bottom, like before or sometimes even after the S2AI screws. And sort of gotten away from that. I wonder if people have had the same problem and figured out a solution. But I, I would like to hear from Greg and um, Bob um, in reference to your question, Bob, that you're asking about should we treat SI joint before or after a long construct? But you guys have been doing the bedrock technique, and to in order to address that, how, how has you been? How's your experience been about that? So, I'll so talk in you. answer to you, you, go ahead, Greg. I'll, I can tackle the, I'll, I'll, how about you do the bedrock one and I'll tackle the, the other one. Yeah. I, okay. Kevin, are you reducing your rod into the iliac bolt or is the bolt the first place you put the rod in and then can it lever down the other way? I think I'm doing the latter most of the time. Yeah. yeah, so usually you want to put the rod into the bolt first and then reduce the rest of the rod down to the rest of the yeah. spine. So I would say that mm -hmm. that's the They're most... That way, uh, that way the forces are uh, are most important. The other thing to do is to use a closed oh. bolt instead of an open one. Mm -hmm. um, if you use a closed bolt, then even if the set screw pops off, the bolt is still inside the tulip head. So it's like mm -hmm. a little bit of an insurance policy. So um, those are the two things that I usually recommend. The other thing is that you have to make sure that there is absolutely no pressure between S1 and your iliac fixation because there's very little movement between those two screws. So when you put your bolt in, sorry, when you put your rod in, there should be no, no, um, reduction. no, for, no reduction needed at all. Like you should just put a set screw in. Um, right. You shouldn't need a tower. You shouldn't need anything to turn down. Like they should sit in there perfectly. If right. they, if you have those um, sort of three things, then you'll typically, typically not run into the, that, that issue with the, the set screws popping off. Yeah. And, and I'll add to what Greg just said. Chris Martin is publishing. I don't think it's out yet, but it will be the, a paper on this dislodgement issue. It seems to be vendor specific. It probably has to do with torque out. Um, if the hell whole head pops off, you got to look at the neck dimension. And then the other two things are, as Greg said, you you know you don't want any stress on those screws. And because of the varied angles, you should always go back and retighten those two screws, those two set screws after everything's in. So that yeah. because you get creep and you get an off angle um, set screw engagement with the rod. So those two in particular, um, you should do with all the screws, but those two in particular are under high stress. So as Greg said, you start with the iliac bolt, but you always go back after everything's tight and retighten it to make sure that the, the creep has led to an underwhelming um, uh, or insufficient torque out of the set screw with the rod. Um, uh, and, and like you said, if you want to use closed head, I, if you look at Martin's data, I, it's not a prolific problem depending on the, the fixation type. And I think if you're adherent to those principles, I don't know that the closed head is absolutely necessary, but it certainly um, can resolve one of those pain points. 
Um, the bedrock thing is still uncertain. You know, the I think the data that we have so far is um, not with the bedrock study, but the clinical data is pretty strongly suggestive that a large minority of patients after uh, multi-level lumbar fusions or deformity surgeries develop X SI pain, um, mm -hmm. a portion of which are more substantially impacted by it. Um, the cost-benefit analysis hasn't been done yet, so we don't really know if we should be prophylaxing these, but that's just on the clinical center. If you look at the failures, uh, they're in the 20% range. Um, some sort of fixation failure, whether it's broken screws, loosening of screws, broken rods, all of which speak to you know some some potential mechanical advantage to having more sustainable fixation uh, rigidity across the SI joint and stabilizing the SI joint, so you don't you don't have continued motion of those joints. Right. Okay. So I can't tell you if it's if it's a um, economically or clinically responsible thing to do. Yeah, that those are the theories at this point. All right, you guys are still getting the data. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Good uh, to talk, Jay. Um, I I I just had a brief comment on on fixation to the pelvis. I think I remember the first uh, paper that was presented in the ISSG or put together was in. Um, uh, lumbar pelvic fixation. So since then, I think still there are debates and in indications. As I, I think we still see patients who probably we can do well with uh, just a uh, L5 S1 fixation, and people can you know patients can do uh, can definitely need a pelvic fixation and. Uh, the modern uh, uh, methods. So I think uh, we still have to work on really those patients who really, you know, pelvic fixation. And and uh, as you know, the more you do, the more complication, possibility of complications. So I'm the head of the roller back. We pretty much, you know, clarify the two indications of pelvic fixation. That's all I just wanted to point out. Thank you, sir. Good point, Doctor. All right. Anything else? Thanks again, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Good job, man.